Well, good morning. How many of you have seen Hacksaw Ridge, the movie? If you haven't seen it, you need to watch that one. Now, here's what's really amazing. Uh, there is a uh, doctor uh, who is 90-something years old, one of the first radiologists in Brevard County that is in my rotary group. He was actually injured, has a purple heart. It was a week before on Iwo Jima where that took place that he was actually there. So when you watch the movie, you're like, wow. Um, you know, it's just amazing to see. And I feel like that's how Daniel's friends felt. Like uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We're not going anywhere until you pray for us. <laughs> we're, not, we're not doing anything. And that's what we want to talk about today. Now, I want to let you in behind the scenes as a pastor of things that you don't see. And he's not in here, so he won't care that I say something about him. David looked at his watch and noticed we were running behind today. Now, you got to realize the praise team practices all week. They practice their songs. And so when we do an extra video, when one of us goes a little long, if the announcement guy tells 12 jokes, whatever, the, the time goes over and they know that means the sermon's going to be shorter. So the longer everybody goes, the shorter the sermon is. And David, without me asking, came back and said, we're going to cut a song today. And so that's the kind of hum humility he has. He says, you know what? I'm not going to take away from the rest of the series, even though the sermon, even though, you know, I've got the, been planning this and I've got all this worked out and we all practiced it this morning and all week I've worked on this song. And that's the kind of humility we have in our church. And I, as a pastor, you need to understand how rare that is. I know a lot of pastors, a lot of music leaders, and there's a lot of tension between music leaders and pastors. You probably don't know that, but music leaders are the number one fired staff. Oh, well, right after youth pastors. But anyway, so we're glad you're here today. And uh, today we're going to talk about trusting God with the answers. And today we're going to give you steps to trusting God with the answers. When I taught school, I'm going to shorten this story a little bit. When I taught school, I had a student that used to go to the restroom every day. And I couldn't figure out how to make her not go to the restroom every day. And I learned my first year of school that if a kid has to go to the restroom, you let him go. Because my first year, my first month of teaching, I told a kid, no, you need to wait. And they came and threw up in my garbage can. From then on, I said, you go whenever you're ready to go to the bathroom. And so I would let her go. And every day she would go. So one day I finally decided, you know what? I need to teach her that it's not good to leave my classroom. And so we used to do notes on the overhead. Do you remember the old overhead that you could make blurry and straight? So I would give all the notes. So I said to the students when she went to the bathroom again, I said, guys, write down everything you can in the notes. I slid the notes down. They wrote all the notes. And when she came back in, I made the overhead totally blurry. And she sat down and started taking notes and realized she couldn't read the screen. So she raised her hand and said, can you fix it? And when I turned it, all the kids went, oh, we can't see it now. So I put it back and finally she got so frustrated that she came up and actually turned the thing and all the kids groaned. So she went back, laid her head down and gave up. All the students laughed. She never went to the bathroom in my class again. Now, I don't know what time you are at in life, but we all have those times where we're asking questions about what's next. Maybe we got a doctor's report. Maybe we had somebody say something to us. Maybe we've got a family member we're praying for. Maybe there's a situation going on in our life and we just don't know what's next. Life's just very blurry and we have to decide what are we going to do when life gets blurry and we don't have the answers. A lot of us, when we're in the in-between, that's the hardest time. And a lot of us, what we do is at that point, we seek entertainment, right? So, you know, we get the, we get the remote control out. That was the old way. Before that, by the way, it was the radio. And now what is it? A screen. Some of you will have three screens open at the same time, right? You got your phone next to you, your iPad or whatever, or your thing in front of you, and a TV going. All three. Why? Because we're trying to distract ourselves sometimes from the reality. Daniel and his friends never did that. This is a faithful group of friends. And here's the thing we tend to seek answers sometimes from all kinds of other places. But God wants us to seek the answers from him. So how can we trust God with the answers? Let's pick up. Number one, ask God's, God for help. Excuse me. Let me just back up. Take a breath. Ask for God's help first. Now, you've got to realize as a pastor, when I'm short on time, my tendency is to try to put the whole message out here. But I'm not going to. So we're going to skip something. 
at some point instead of me trying to talk faster and think I can get through the whole message. Is that okay with you, Candy? Sure, Candy will just stay after. How many of you had a dad that flipped TV channels? How many of you flip TV channels, right? How many of you have not watched a whole commercial in forever, right? We're, that's the kind of people we are, more faster, you know, microwave oven, and then we get Instapot, right? How many of you have an Instapot? Instapot beans and ribs are awesome, by the way, right? We get faster and faster, more stuff. In chapter two, when it picks up, um, the king has a dream, and he's disturbed by his dream. Now, here's what's amazing. Last night, I had an awful dream. Rodney, it was interesting you talked about that. Last night, I had terrible dreams in the middle of the night, just weird dreams. And I thought, maybe, maybe God's trying to show me what it was like to be Nebuchadnezzar. I don't know if you've ever had a dream that woke you up. <gasps> How many of you have ever had the falling dream? Isn't that a joy to wake up to? <gasps> you know, it's, you probably sleep apnea. But anyway, so, um, so he calls his wise men in and says, tell me the meaning of the dream. And they all say, we can't tell you. You're, you're asking us to tell you something that God can't tell. So he asked the king's officer, so what does he do? So the king says, I'm going to kill everybody. And then we pick up the story with Daniel saying, what's going on? He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went to the king and he asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Now this shows that Nebuchadnezzar had respect for Daniel already. By the way, you'll notice Daniel's attitude towards authority once again. He humbled himself before authority. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained his matters to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, who we know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Isn't it interesting? We know Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego by their Babylonians' names, and Daniel we know by his Jewish name. Isn't that interesting? Anyway, he urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. So Daniel says to the king, can you wait and not kill all of us? I can't imagine what it was like. To not only, first of all, go to the person who was in charge of executing you and saying, why does the king want to execute us? And then going to the very person who wanted you killed and saying, could you give us a little more time? But Daniel knew that God was more powerful than the Babylonian gods. See, when you look at Babylon, when you would come into Babylon, here's some pictures of that gate that I talked about last week. When you would come into Babylon, by the way, you can find these up at the several museums in America. You, they would have lions, not tigers and bears. They would have lions, they would have unicorns, dragons. They all represented their gods. And here was the idea. When you were a conquered nation, Nebuchadnezzar and people of that time felt like that proves that our God is more powerful than your God. Now, the good news is Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had been to VBS. So they knew the Bible. They knew what God said about things. They had a history. So when they were dragged through this wall, by the way, if you want to see the size of, this is just the front wall recreated in Germany. There's a little podium there that people stand at, just to give you an idea. So they would have gone inside of this first Ishtar gate, and then they would have gone a half mile to a mile with these pillars with all of these scary figures dragged in chains and then gone to an even larger gate before they ever even got into Babylon. There would be a tendency for us to say, maybe our God isn't that strong. But Daniel never gave up. Have you ever come to a point in your life that you feel like, maybe God doesn't want to answer? Maybe I'll never find out? My circumstances are so bad. This is what Jesus said about it. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. We're going to skip those key verses. Number two, seek God's glory and knock for answers. You know, this week we had, we had uh, VBS here and I got to be the rec director. Got to wear my cool hard hat. This is not, I'm surprised they don't have a warning label in here. 
that says, not for real use, because like everything has that, like you would think that somehow this would protect your head. But we got to wear hard hats this week, and we got to play games, and one of the things I played this week with the kids is something called hide the wing nut. It's similar to hide the whistle if you've ever played that, but basically you take something small, so I took a wing nut, and I would put it, I would tell all the kids, put your heads down, I would put it somewhere in the room, just somewhere out in the open. You weren't allowed to move anything, and the kids had to find it, and here was the rule. I said, when you find the wing nut, don't point at it, don't grab it, don't yell, go to the middle and sit down. If you're the first one that sees it and sits down, you get to hide it next. In every single class, you know what happened? <gasps> every single time. A couple of times, kids grabbed it and went and sat down. You know why? They weren't listening. They didn't take time to listen. Now, we love to look at kids and say, you're not listening, or to our husbands, right? <laughs> you're not listening to me. But the truth is, when it comes sometimes to hearing God, we don't take time to read God's word. We don't take time sometimes, even when we read God's word. We, listen, you can read your Bible, maybe you have your Bible study using daily bread, and, and you literally put it down, walk into the next room, and if I said to you, what did you just read about? You'd go, huh? If you're going to meditate on God's word, then you have to not only spend time in the Bible, but say, hey, I want to try to remember a piece of that. That's why it's important. Take these verses, cut these notes up, put them different places. Number two, seek God's glory and knock for answers I just talked about. And then in verse 19 to 26, Daniel gets the answer. He praises God. And here's what's awesome. Daniel could have wiped out the competition at this point. I forgot this was on my head still. Daniel, could, so I just saw somebody going, is he still wearing that? Daniel could have at this point had all those other wise men executed. But you know what he did? He said, king, don't execute anybody. The king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel replied. Now listen to the beginning of this reply and imagine what Nebuchadnezzar was thinking. No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he's asked about. That is exactly what all the other wise men said. So you can imagine King Nebuchadnezzar like, well, that's what I thought. You don't know. Now, there's a debate whether Nebuchadnezzar remembered his dream and he was testing the wise men. Or if Nebuchadnezzar woke up, freaked out, and said, I can't remember what I dreamed. Tell me what I dreamed. We don't know which one it is. But Daniel starts out by saying, no, I can't tell you your dream. Now, I don't know about you, but to a guy who is going to have me ripped apart, that would not be the first thing out of my mouth. It just shows how amazing Daniel's faith is. And then he continues. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. What was Daniel doing? Daniel was saying, even though I've been dragged into your city... Even though you have all these foreign gods on your walls, my God can tell you what this is really about. And then he continues. He's shown the king Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come. Your dreams and the vision that passed through your mind as you were lying in bed are these. As your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to things to come. And the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive, but so that your majesty may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. What did Daniel do first? Daniel first sought God. He didn't worry first. That's usually our first response. He didn't get angry first. How dare they do that to me? What did he do? He prayed. When's the last time you had an opportunity to get upset because something wasn't fair? Something wasn't right? Daniel first said, I'm going to seek God. And then he went to his friends and said, would you pray? And then what does he do here? He continues to seek what God wants and God gives him answers. That's the reason we have this verse in here twice today. Matthew 7 verse 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Do you know why sometimes we don't hear from God or we wonder and life seems blurry? Because just like the kids who came over and went, oh, 
We spend time in God's word, but we spend more time worrying. We might spend time in church, but we spend more time watching the news and listening to their opinion of the world instead of listening to God's truth about who we are. Daniel could have run around and talked about it being unfair. He, could, he and his three friends could have started picketing the, the capital. That would have been the end of them, by the way. Right? They could have done all kinds of things. But what did they do? They sought God first. They knocked and said, God, what do you want to happen? They asked for his help. They sought his glory. By the way, you'll notice Daniel over and over says, only God can do this. Only God can do this. Whenever somebody compliments you, I want to encourage you with these words. Only God. Last week, somebody was telling me, I love that sermon, Eric. That was so good. You have such a way of sharing it. And I said what I always say, which is God uses donkeys. And they laughed. And I said, I meant David. Who did you think I was talking about? Which David loves when I say that too. Right? But here's what C.S. Lewis said years ago. He said, when somebody compliments you, you just say thank you. And then you lift that compliment as roses to the Lord. So when somebody tells you something, hey, you did a great job. When you do a great job at work or somebody gives you a, a performance review that's really good. and You just say, God, thank you that you've given me the ability to do that. Daniel did that over and over. Daniel could have said, well, I'm just real disciplined and really smart and blah, blah, blah. No, Daniel said, only God can do this. Number three, witness to others when God answers. When's the last time you shared your faith with somebody? When's the last time you told a faith story about what God is doing in your life? When's the last time you went out of your way to even say to somebody, hey, do you go to church anywhere? I'd love you to come to church with me. When's the last time you went out of your way to be a witness for God? There's simple ways to do that. And there's more confrontational ways to do that. There's ways where you can just say, hey, can I pray for you when somebody mentions something to you? And there may come a point that sometimes you have to say to somebody, do you know what it means to be a Christian? But when's the last time that you even went out of your way to say, God, I want to be a witness for you? Do you know why God had Daniel in this position? Because no matter what was going on in the life of Daniel, he said, God, I'm going to trust you in the middle of this. What's going on in your life right now? Are you choosing to trust God with it or are you trusting yourself? Do you go and ask everybody their opinion about what you should do next? Or do you say, God, I want to hear from you first. Now, there's nothing wrong with getting opinions. Listen, I want you to watch the news. I want you to know what's going on in the world. I don't want you to be one of those oblivious people who has no idea, okay? Being a Christian doesn't mean that you're not in the world at all. You're in the world. You're just not of the world. But that God's opinion is always more important than anybody else's opinion. That's the reason God used Daniel. Listen to what happened next. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain. Let me time out for a second. So what was Nebuchadnezzar's vision? He saw this huge statue of himself. By the way, Nebuchadnezzar thought he was going to be eternal. <clears throat> this was a time where he figured out he wasn't. Have you had those moments happen yet when you had that car accident? You had that doctor's report? You realized you weren't eternal? Well, you are eternal, but your body's not, just so you know. And so Nebuchadnezzar woke up freaked out. And so Daniel went through and told him all these different parts of what was going on. And at the very end, he talks about the rock. He's talking about Jesus, our rock, the kingdom of heaven. He says, this is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut of the mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke iron, bronze, clay, silver, and gold to pieces. So everything that Nebuchadnezzar saw, the, 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 the present and the future was going to be wiped out by God's kingdom. The dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate, be, prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. Then listen to this. The king said to Daniel, surely your God is the God of gods. This was a huge change, by the way, for Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar went from worshiping all these other gods to saying, your God is the real God. He's Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position, lavished many gifts on him, made him ruler over the entire province of, province of Babylon, and placed him in charge of all its wise men. 
before God gives you responsibility, he will always take you through a trial. Before God puts you in a place where you can be a witness to others, he will always take you through things where you have a choice. You can do what's easy. And, you know, Daniel and his friends could have all just remained quiet. They could have all just hid out. They could have all, from the very beginning, just eaten the food. They, they would have never been in the position of even being a wise men if they had just kind of laid back. But they did what God wanted them to do. And what happened? They became wise men. Well, because they became wise men, guess what? They were about to get ripped apart, which was not fun, by the way. Sometimes when you do what God wants you to do, you struggle. Did you know sometimes when you do what God wants you to do, you suffer for it? Did you know sometimes when you do what God wants you to do, life becomes more difficult, not easy? But listen to what Jesus said about that. He talked about being dragged to prison. And he said, on my account, you'll be brought before governors and kings. And then what's the purpose? As witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. Here's what Daniel realized. And here's what Jesus realized. And here's what we need to realize. No matter what's happening in your life, God has a bigger purpose than you can see. And I know you're seeing your circumstance and it's overwhelming you and life feels blurry and you don't know why God would allow that to happen. And you're disturbed like Nebuchadnezzar and you're freaked out because you're in a position that you never thought you'd be in. But if you will let him, if you'll seek God first, if you'll knock and say, God, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Help me to trust you if you will. Seek him in all your ways and give him the glory. Then he will use even the awful things in your life to be a blessing to others. He'll even use you during the most difficult, confusing, frustrating times in your life. If you'll trust him. You know what he promises when we trust him? Is that he'll give peace that passes understanding. Do you have peace today? If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, if you're watching online, I'll let you know what gives you the most peace. Is knowing that with a relationship with Jesus, you spend eternity in heaven. That his peace covers you even now. And if you're a Christian and you're not walking in that peace, I just want to encourage you. Hey, put the remote down. <laughs> Take some time to listen to God. Put a couple of your devices away. Sit with God's word and say, God, would you speak to me today? And when you do that, that peace that passes understanding will fill you. And your friends and family that see you going through trial and struggle and difficulty will look at you and say, what's different about you? And they'll want the relationship with God that you have. My prayer for you is that you would know that he will take care of you regardless of what happens now and in eternity. So my prayer for us on looking at Daniel chapter 2 is that we would remember that no matter what comes next, when we trust in God, he is going to use us every day. If you'd like to know what it means to be a Christian, I'd love to talk to you after the service. I'll be here after the service. You can come and talk to me. If you're watching online, you can send me a note. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, thank you for these moments. I thank you for your word. Father, I thank you for the book of Daniel, which reminds us of all that you've done. As we look back through history at young men who served you no matter what came, no matter what the circumstances they trusted you, Lord, remind us in our circumstances to trust you. Lord, we look at the world and we get worried and we get frustrated and we get irritated. Lord, I pray that just like Daniel and his friends that were put in circumstances they didn't deserve, that we could trust you so much that your peace would overwhelm us. That our trust in you would be so strong that we would know whatever's next, Father, that you'll walk with us. Lord, thank you for that this morning. We trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.